Want to get faster at riding a bicycle? Here's eight tips that might help you. No massive changes. You've been cycling regularly for a while and you've just chosen an event to do in a few months time. A big event. So it's time to crank up your training to the max. Wait, no, don't do that. We know that volume of training is extremely important when it comes to improving cycling fitness and consistency of training will aid this. But consistency of training will go down the pan if you make large unsustainable changes to your training or even lifestyle. So add little by little. If you're riding a couple of times a week, add an extra 10 minutes of riding to each session. Perhaps this is an extra loop in your commute, or it means getting up 10 minutes earlier for your turbo session. Easily achievable things. It won't feel like much to begin with, but it will be having an effect on your body. Have a think. Who's going to be fitter after 365 days? The person who does three months of 20 hour weeks, Tabata training, high intensity intervals, sacrifices their social life, and then gets burnt out and doesn't train for the rest of the year. Or the person who does four medium rides a week all year, and then rides hard sometimes for fun. Slowly, slowly. Ride regularly instead of a lot in one go. Now we're not talking about pros here. So let's look at some numbers that are relatable and achievable. Doing five individual 30 minute rides during the week will almost certainly be more beneficial than doing one two and a half hour ride. The human body reacts really well to a healthy amount of stress in the form of exercise. And it's hugely beneficial for us to be in a state of recovery from exercise and not just from a fitness perspective. Some personal anecdotal evidence here. I'm in a better mood. I have more energy. I sleep better. I get more work done on days when I do a bit of exercise, even if it's a short bit. We're talking 20 minutes on the turbo trainer or going for a short run when I'm really busy. I want those benefits and I would lose them if I was doing a massive ride on the weekends, wrecking myself and then not be able to do any exercise for the rest of the week. It's less compatible with the life that I wanna lead. Only in cycling do you finish a two hour session and your friends go, oh, that was a short ride. These short rides add up and chances are they're easier to squeeze into a normal person's life as well. Further to this, little and often also means you build habits, like learning what stuff to put in your pockets before a ride or a really good cleaning routine after your ride. These things eventually become like clockwork and doing smaller sessions will accelerate that process. You won't freeze riding in the rain for five hours. You're less likely to get injured because of the recovery in between the sessions and you'll probably be motivated more because you're chipping away at a larger goal through the week. Most importantly, the sessions will be more manageable and achievable. Ticking off sessions one by one will be great for your confidence instead of just biting off more than you can chew, failing, and then having that to deal with. Sure, there'll be some exceptions here. Some people will only have one day a week where they can ride. Some people will be training for super long ultra endurance events, and those people should go for it. There's no hard and fast rules. But if you have the option, which method here do you think will create the most consistency? Fuel. Unlike most other sports, cycle training and events are really long. Only in cycling do you do a two hour ride and your friends turn around and say it's a short one. To get through these sessions, you're gonna need to eat food. <laughs> it's a trap a lot of people fall into because if an exercise session is less than an hour, you don't generally need to eat. And that's the duration most people exercise for. Even the strongest athlete in the world is gonna end up riding pretty slowly if they forget to bring food on a long ride and they bonk. Also known as hitting the wall in running or hypoglycemia, if you want the medical term. It means low blood sugar and it's a state that's easy to get into if you forget to eat little often on a bike ride. I always take a bit of food in my pockets if I'm gonna be riding over an hour, and it doesn't have to be specific cycling products like this Sturka stuff. It can be a jam sandwich, or a banana, or some fizzy sweets, Percy Pigs. I've even seen people using icing or frosting for the American viewers, like a block of it you can chop up in your pocket. It's just pure sugar. The cheapest option, but it's a bit rank, isn't it? 60 to 100 grams of carbohydrate an hour is a good figure to aim for. You'll feel better, recover better, and ride faster if you do this. Any shifters. If you want to ride really fast, then here's a hack you might want to try. Even if you're running the correct bar width, you might want to try and get even narrower at the front of your bike to reduce your CDA so you cut through the air even faster. The narrower you put your shifters, the more that's gonna happen. Angling in your shifters will move your hands closer together and can be done by using usually a five millimeter Allen key underneath your shifter hood 
to loosen them off. You probably will sacrifice some comfort here though, because bicycle shifters haven't been designed with this in mind. It will probably feel less comfortable the more extreme you go. So do a little by little and test it out. This is actually quite a good way of reducing your handlebar width without having to buy a whole new handlebar as well. So you can test out a few different positions, particularly if you have an integrated bar and stem, which can be difficult and expensive to change. Funnily enough, the UCI banned any shifters when they're past a certain angle. So I bear this in mind if you're gonna race a UCI event. Bike position. Holding a good aerodynamic position on the bike far outweighs any gains that you can make with equipment. So things like aero helmets and aero frames. What constitutes a good aero position though? Generally, a lower torso angle and a smaller frontal area will be faster. You could experiment with a longer stem, less spaces underneath your stem to get lower, any shifters, shrugging your shoulders, completely free one, and focusing on keeping your head lower without sacrificing your ability to see. The faster you're able to ride to start with, the more a good position will have an effect because the faster you go, the more difference it will make. But even at moderate speeds, there is a difference. Paid aero gains. Aero gains from equipment can be a serious rabbit hole. So. To save this becoming a three hour video, here's some of the most common ones in a list. Tighter fitting clothing, skin suits, aero socks, shoe covers, taping up helmet vents, aero helmets, deep wheels, the deeper they are, the faster they are, disc wheels, matching tire width to rim width so it's flush, aero bike frames, and aero bars. All of these are fairly expensive for the gains that you get. So I would urge you to do some of the free tips in the previous point first. Drafting. Obvious to experienced cyclists, but often a surprise to beginners. Cycling behind somebody else saves a huge amount of energy. Studies have shown energy savings of 27 to 50% for holding the wheel of a rider in front. There's loads of variables here, like wind speed, wind direction, how fast you're riding, sizes of the riders involved, but the crux here is that it is massively beneficial. It's the reason why pro cyclists all ride in groups and the breakaway splits away and it's a bunch of riders riding really close to each other. And that's what creates all the tactics in road racing. It can be scary at first. You don't want to ride too close to the rider in front and ride into their back wheel and have a crash. So practice much further back when you first start. Eventually it will become second nature. I'd suggest starting with a nice big gap and also being slightly off to one side which means you can still see in front what's coming up, whether it's potholes or other hazards. Eventually, and especially in racing, riders will start to trust each other completely and they won't be looking ahead. They'll just be trusting what the rider in front is doing. Similar to the aero gains that we touched on in other points, the faster you go, the more of an effect drafting will have. However, it will still work at lower speeds. It's a great skill to learn and will certainly make you faster in a variety of different situations. Without a goal, you can't score. Maybe this is just me, but I'm gonna put it in this tips video anyway. If I don't have a goal, my riding falls apart. I get distracted too easily and I don't end up riding regularly, which is very, very important if you wanna get faster. So I always set a goal. Goals can be varied. For example, riding your first 100 kilometers, a target FTP of 250 watts, a 20 minute lap of Richmond Park, getting a second cat racing license, or cycling every day for 30 days. I like setting medium term achievable goals and then setting a new one when I've achieved it. Chances are this will also make you faster. Have you got any tips for riding faster? Please put them in the comment section down below and please subscribe to this channel for more.